The term cuckolding is related to the cuckoo bird that lays an egg in the nest of other species. And then that egg hatches sooner. And then the cuckoo chick consumes the food and the resources of the other species. And early naturalists looked at that and said, well, that's what happens if a guy's wife cheats on him. The man is at risk of investing resources in a child not genetically related to him. Cuckolding. Why did you get into that? <laughs> why did well uh, to be clear why did i get into writing and reading and researching about it and working with people that, that engage in it um uh back in like 2007 um i was clinically depressed um i in my day job so to speak i run a, a large you know community mental health center agency uh traditional behavioral health services lots of medicaid hr budget all those kinds of issues um and it it was really challenging. I was really struggling. So <clears throat> um, I, I started collecting data for a study about uh, consensual non-monogamy. At the time, very little had been published about polyamory, et cetera. And uh, I never published the study. It was, a, it was a crappy little study, probably not very good anyway. But as I was doing it, I ran into these two couples who lived the cuckold or hot wife lifestyle, where the wife was uh, enthusiastically, um, you know, sexual with people outside the relationship, with men outside the relationship, and the, and the husband was monogamous. And my initial impression and reaction was honestly to say, wow, that that's crazy. That that can't work. Um, but what was really remarkable was that uh, both of these couples had been married for decades. They had incredibly successful careers, uh, very healthy, you know, kids, families, um, incredible communication skills. By every measure that we would, as a therapist, you know, apply, these were very healthy people. And so then I, I kind of questioned myself. I was like, well, why did I assume that, that they're unhealthy? And, and at that point, you know, I'd been working around sexuality issues for a while, but, but I realized that without noticing it, I was applying moral biases around female sexuality, around promiscuity, around monogamy. And those biases had snuck into my clinical thinking. And so I, uh, went to the literature and there was nothing published about this. There was, there was one study in the nineties by an Israeli psychologist who analyzed, you know, letters to penthouse about wife sharing. And, um, there was nothing else, nothing else published about this. And then as I started, you know, talking to people, I started hearing how common this was. And so I dove into the literature, um, evolutionary psychology, uh, psychology of monogamy, biology of, of sexuality, female sexual arousal. Um, uh, and I also interviewed people um, around the world who were living uh, this, this lifestyle. And, and at the end of the day, I found that, you know, there were actually lots of people who, clinicians like me, who, um, assumed it was unhealthy because they'd never been taught how diverse sexuality is. Um, and uh, the fascinating thing is, I mean, you know, when I wrote the book, um, nobody was really talking about cuckolding. But over the past few years, it's really exploded. I mean, we've got, you know, the Jerry Falwell Jr. scandal, um, multiple folks around uh, the Trump administration actually involved in cuckolding. And um, it's super popular in pornography now. Uh, and we didn't see any of that coming. Um, and, and my book, uh, Insatiable Wives on the topic, um, re was re-released as an audio book last year. And it's just like flying off the shelves on audible because people love to go on these road trips with their wife and pop that in and then say, Hey, what do you think? There is a very large cohort of men that are listening right now who are thinking, fuck no, how uh, is a man able to get past his inherent uh, concern around his wife going off with another man? We are evolutionary programmed for male parental uncertainty to be something that we are incredibly fear uh, scared of, right? Mm -hmm. How is this something, not only that a non-insignificant group of people, men, can deal with, but can actually 
take pleasure from? It's a really interesting question, Chris, and it's it's one that you know I'm starting to think we need to research because you're right. There there are many men that when they the fear of infidelity by their female partner triggers rage and even you know murderous behaviors. Uh, fear of infidelity is really common in in spousal homicide. But then there are these other men that the idea of their wife being unfaithful turns them on. What's the difference between these guys? Right now, we don't know. Um, I, I will speculate that uh, some of it is about openness to experience. Um, uh, it, there may be some some kink in this. Um, uh, many of the, the men who explore cuckolding um, are interested in submission uh, from a, a bondage and discipline kind of standpoint, but not all. Um, there is what's really interesting, though, is that the men who grow up in highly uh, rigid, stereotyped, masculinized kind of uh, environments are actually more likely to be turned on by the idea of cuckolding because it's an escape from the constrictive rigidity of in order to be a man, you know, you must be so manly that your wife would never even want another man. And there are lots of guys that, you know, find that pressure kind of a burden and they, they want to escape from it or at least a vacation from it and cuckolding and the opportunity to kind of sit back and sort of watch um, is, is less pressure for these guys. Now, interestingly, um, you know, cuckolding and fantasies of cuckolding appear to be more common in Republicans than Democrats. They uh, appear to be more prevalent in uh, highly macho kind of societies, Brazil, what's the, Russia. What's the, what's the data that you're pulling that sort of stuff from? Um uh, a couple of different sources. One, uh, Justin Lay Miller is a psychologist, um, a co-author with me on some research around great Twitter thing. follow. Everyone should follow yeah, Justin. Absolutely, and he's he's got data on the prevalence of sexual fantasies um, related to politics and and political stances. Um, and is that then, self-report? Uh, fourth. Yeah, self-report four thousand. I mean, how do you? Uh, how, how would it be otherwise? We, I mean, I'm not sure how we would measure people's I, I don't know aside some, like, from some implicit bias bullshit on a computer <laughs> where you're selecting. Oh, joy! Yeah, you know okay, I mean? great. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I don't know, but okay, yeah, cool. So you've asked a non-insignificant sample of people about their sexual mm -hmm. fantasies, and in that, cuckolding appears to show up. How much? How much does it show up? Um, you know, in Justin's research, I want to say he found that, uh, oh, there's a siren going by. Sorry. That's fine. Um, in Justin's research, I want to say he found about 50 to 55% of men were reported that they had had at least one fantasy of watching their female partner with another man. Around 45% of women reported, uh, that they were interested in being watched with another man by their partner. Dude, that is unbelievable like i i don't deny that justin has got the, the the data to back this up but i just think how is there more than 50 percent of men not only that but there's 10 percent more men that want to see their wife get fucked by another man or at least have fantasized about mm -hmm. it once and the difference between maybe thinking about it right and going through with it is literally a universe apart right you know there's a lot of things that we think about doing that we don't right and you know sexual fantasies are cognitive exploration um they oftentimes are a way we kind of work through things um you know dan savage um also a co-author with me on some research around cuckolding um he uh he argued that 
the cuckold fantasy is an eroticization of fear that because men are afraid of their wife cheating on them, that in order to take away the sting of that fear, they eroticize it and turn it into something that is that they then sexually fantasize about or sexually aroused by. I think it's an interesting idea, but we don't see very many people, you know, eroticizing spiders um, and it, as a way to deal with their fear of spiders. So I don't know that the eroticism of fear um, strategy is 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 really a good explanation. I think that there's a lot of explanations. Now, I did when I wrote the book. Um, most of the men that were into cuckolding uh, were men that already had kids, and so you know you mentioned parental uncertainty a minute ago, and you know the it, it, it's interesting to recognize that the, the term cuckolding is related to the cuckoo bird that lays an an egg in the nest of other species, and then that egg hatches sooner, and then the cuckoo chick, uh, you know, consumes the food and the resources of the other species, and even will like push the other eggs out of the nest. And early naturalists looked at that and said, well, that's what happens if a guy's wife cheats on him. Um, that now the, 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 the man is at risk of investing resources in a child not genetically related to him. So they called it cuckolding. Um, at the, when I wrote the book um, in 2009, uh, most of the men that were into it already had kids. And I didn't see very many young men that were into this fantasy. And interestingly, just in 10 years, we've seen a big shift. Um, and I'm seeing more young men that don't have kids that are interested in uh, cuckold porn and cuckold fantasy and even cuckold behavior. So that to me, the first instance that you had would make a lot of sense mm -hmm. because you would think, if male parental uncertainty is no longer a concern, right. these men will be insulated, at least in part, from this fear. I mean, again, for me, mm -hmm. it, it is still, dude, it is absolutely blowing my mind that there is not more than like a, a, a tiny, tiny handful of guys that can do this. There's a famous YouTuber who um, put a video up last year, uh, tried swinging, uh, went to a, a sex party of some kind, and he tells this relatively in-depth story about watching his girlfriend that he loved next to him with some other guy. And he said that he just had to immediately leave. It had traumatized him so much to observe the girl that he was in love with mm -hmm. having sex with another man. And it's kind of become a bit of a meme on the internet. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, some of my friends are incredibly open with regards to their sex lives. I don't think that they're particularly repressed. But I know that if that was a situation that occurred, one of two things would happen they would leave and get out and be traumatized or they would smash the guy to bits. Like those are the only two options that they have. And I think, I wonder whether, I wonder what is occurring to downregulate that response. Maybe it is this, um, like you say, this eroticization of fear. I can see that as a thing. And I think that uh, the difference between the spiders and the, um, cuckold fear generation is that that is already a, within the domain of sex, right? Spiders mm -hmm. aren't within the domain of sex, but watching somebody else have sex with your partner is. Uh, and also the taboo transgression thing, you know, it's the high powered boss mm -hmm. bitch CEO woman who loves to be tied up on an evening time by her hot playboy, because there is something about the polarity that creates that, that attraction right? That's what is exciting about it. It's letting go of whatever you are, the role that you have to play out there. I think, right. for instance, one of the side effects that you're going to have of BLM over the last three years is probably an increase in race play in the bedroom as you make uh, race a more taboo subject in public. Yeah. I think in private, you're absolutely going to see this go up. All of that rolled together, all of the, all of the, all of the things, I just think it is such a fundamental fear that men have for this to occur. And it, it blows my mind that guys can get past it. And that fundamental fear, though, comes, comes with a lot of energy. And that uh, that's one of the things that, that I see in these couples is that they take that fear and that jealousy <clears throat> – 
and they translate it, uh, transmute it even into this kind of turbocharged sexual excitement. I mean, we, a guy is, it, it, interestingly, when a guy believes his female mate may have been unfaithful, he is more likely to um, have more vigorous sex with her, thrust more deeply and harder, and more likely to get aroused and 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 want to have want to have sex again, right? Now, the, some of this is the sperm competition theory that eh, uh, some research around it is not replicated, but I still think that 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 evolutionary drive to compete um, is part of what. Uh, folks are using here and kind of co-opting it in this uh, strategy to increase their excitement. Have you seen any evidence suggesting that this could be some repurposed repressed homosexuality mm. that men could want to perhaps be involved with another mm -hmm. man, but he's currently got a wife and the closest he can get to a man is letting her have sex with another man. And if you were to do some eye tracking during that event, you might find that his eyes are on him more than her. Right. Um, absolutely. I mean, first, let me let me say, you know, as with any sexual behavior, um, this is complex. There are lots of different factors and reasons for each individual person that drive them into this um, or, or make it arousing for them. But you're absolutely right. For a significant portion of these guys, there was some suppressed bisexuality. Remember that most of these guys are coming from more conservative uh, political or social backgrounds where being bisexual or having same sex interests it, it isn't acceptable, but you know you can have sex with your wife with another man through the vehicle of your wife's body, um, interacting with um, with his penis sexually, or, or inter interacting with his semen by going down on her afterwards. Um, you know, a friend of mine on YouTube. Uh, runs the the fuck yeah friendly fire um, web uh, uh, account where he shares porn of guys you know interacting with each other sexually as they are having sex with a woman, and there's a lot of you know. Uh, bisexual um, kind of interest in there that is coming out in these soft bisexual behaviors. What was the proportion of men that had some sort of bisexual inclination. Can you remember? Ah, <sighs> you know, we didn't, um, I didn't collect numbers on that with these, with the research that I did for my book. It was, it was much more qualitative kind of research. Um, I, I would roughly guesstimate that bisexuality is probably 30 or 40 percent of guys that are into into cuckolding. Um, now, Joe Court is a psychologist and a friend of mine, and he, he points out that there are guys who have sex with other guys when they're not motivated from a bisexual kind of place. And I, I've questioned that, but Joe has a good example of a guy who, you know, is not bisexual and not attracted to other men, but he's very into being submissive. And so if his wife or a dominatrix forces him to have sex with another man, even though he's not into it for the other man, he's into it because that is the ultimate level of submission. And so it is erotically wow, arousing, is... not because of this, not because of the guy, but because of the submission. That is one hell of a level of submission. Mm -hmm. I'm Wow, dude, some of the um, like corners of the internet with kinks. I didn't think that I was particularly vanilla sexually, but dear God, uh, this, this makes me think, this makes me think that I don't, okay, so. Well, you know, it, that, and that, it, remember where I started that because most therapists and most people don't know this 90% of therapists and psychologists and mental health clinicians in the United States have almost no training in sexuality. So we've always assumed that vanilla is the norm, but, uh, it's not that vanilla. Yeah. It's well, not, it's not, it's not, I'm not, I'm not that vanilla, right? <laughs> I'm relatively vanilla. 
But we, what we know now, actually, research from, from Quebec um, uh, in Canada um, has found that around 50% of a normative population, non-clinical population, have interest in things like exhibitionism, sadism, masochism, um, voyeurism, um, things that we used to think were disorders. And about 30% of people have engaged in those behaviors. And so what we're finding now is that the norm is actually much more diverse than yeah. we ever believed. But people kept their mouth shut because they didn't want to be shamed for it. The sexual Overton window perhaps is a little bit wider than we might have first realized. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hot wifing. What's hot wifing? Um, hot wifing is this uh, kind of offshoot of cuckolding. Um, cuckolding typically involves a, you know, more of a submissive stance by the male where he is, you know, taking a, a, a submissive uh, role to, to his wife and her, uh, the men that she may be with. A hot wife, it looks a little bit more like swinging where the husband is not in a uh, submissive role, but is sharing his wife with other men. Um, now we're also now hearing about something called stag vixen, and that is roughly looking like you know hot wife kind of thing. But the man is really taking a um, a stance with that label and saying, "I'm not a cuck. I'm not being humiliated. I'm not weak. I'm strong by sharing my wife with other men." And some of this relates to the you know the politics over the past few years, where Republicans and people on Fox News and everything else were calling each other cuck if they appeared weak at all. And so I think that guys then that were interested in sharing their wives didn't want people to take that as a as a uh, coming from a place of weakness does cuckolding ever go wrong and destroy a relationship yeah absolutely i mean i've i've seen um i've seen couples where uh the husband was was really obsessive and um the the focus or fantasy of of cuckolding um became so obsessive and dominant in his relate in his sexuality that the wife um reacted negatively and 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 in some cases even divorced i've seen some cuckold couples where uh the wife falls in love with the other guy and leaves um that's the fear um i think that as with any non-monogamous uh, relationship it can be done right and it can be done poorly typically the relationships that i see fail um for cuckolding fail for other reasons and the cuckold uh you know fantasy or behavior kind of just exposed some of those cracks in the relationship and what we found in research uh with gay cuckold couples was that in general um if it was a healthy couple um that exploring cuckolding was a healthy uh aspect to the relationship what is different about gay or lesbian is there such a thing as female cuckolding what's the reverse do women have fantasies about watching their husband have sex with another wife some it's called cut queening um and the, it's spelled it's spelled kind of funny um uh, instead of q u e e it's spelled q u e a for some reason i'm not entirely sure um it's it's much 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 less common um than the fantasy of cuckolding but yeah there are um wives who get aroused at the idea of their their husband with other with other women um and you know i is that it, one of the things that that we see happen in a lot of non-monogamous relationships and in cuckolding especially and 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 cut queening i guess is that the more attractive your partner is to other people the more attractive they become to you right because and yeah, there's a lot of you know talk online about you know women being interested in men that are attracted attractive to other women right um, is that some of it? Maybe um, I I I called it the queen bee um, or the or the or, or the king bee kind of uh, phenomenon in my book, where you know having having a partner that is attractive to other partners and that you can share with them, but then you get to take them home, um, feels kind of rewarding and exciting and fulfilling. What I'm thinking about is how 
wild and interesting it is that on average, females show more bisexuality than males. There's more mm-hmm. gay men, but there's more bisexual women in the world. And ancestrally, polygyny was more common than mm-hmm. what's the what's the one where it's one woman polyandry. Polyandry. polyandry thank you. Um, so we have you know at least some ancestral uh, predisposition to this one man many women we also have a increased preference amongst a non insignificant cohort of women for women compared with men for men at least when you've got uh, the bisexual relationship and yet you're saying that f- queen being whatever it was called a uh, female queening or whatever is significantly rarer than the thing which seems to be statistically in terms of sexual preference less likely and ancestrally in terms of predisposition less programmed that's so interesting it it is all super interesting and um we don't know what it looks like um in in societies where there is greater egalitarian sexual economics in the polygynous history reproduction and mating was oftentimes women's only kind of economic value or resource that they that they controlled um so you know i know i know you know jordan peterson got got in trouble by talking about you know the the, that we should have you know socially enforced Enforced monogamy monogamy. right he didn't use the word socially which was the problem that was why he got in trouble right and you know and and he's got a point because historically you know polygamous societies had higher rates of violent crime because you had powerful men that had all the hot chicks and you had lots of young men who couldn't date or mate or reproduce and And so they had nothing better to do than start trouble. Um, But again, in that historic, in in that historical society, women didn't have economic independence like we have now. What's really interesting is that as men's economic uh, index goes up, infidelity actually tends to go down. But as women's economic index, yeah, index goes up, infidelity goes up because female women, infidelity or male female, infidelity? Female infidelity. So women who are economically independent are more likely to engage in infidelity because they're not going to lose everything. They're not going to. They're not going to be destitute uh, living in a shelter. Would the it not also be for them aren't as great? Would it not also be the case that women who are more economically independent are struggling to find a mate hypergamously that's above and across from them, which means that it is more likely they're going to have to mate down. William Costello's got some new data around this that suggests that hypergamy is actually on the decline a tiny little bit. However, it's also going down in line with female-only infidelity, which is going up in line with rates Mm -hmm. of domestic violence. So all of this is sort of uh, cascading together. And 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 we we see uh, you know men who are married to a woman who makes more than him are more likely to engage in infidelity um, with that uh, whether that's insecurity now infidelity oftentimes is motivated to kind of fill some insecurity. Um, am I still attractive to other people? Um, do I have options? Um, can I explore aspects of myself with other people that I don't get to explore with my primary partner? Um, and so again, you know, the, that, that's, that, that's the one concern I have about a lot of evolutionary arguments and, and Costello is brilliant. He's a good friend of mine and I love his research, but. Um, evolutionary arguments can be really great just so stories that um, explain really complicated behavior. And as a psychologist, as a clinical psychologist, I want to live in the complicated land. I want to, I want to, I want I want to deal with and recognize all of the multiple things that are influencing these issues and not reduce it to, to single factors. Yeah, I understand that. I think, um, What's happening in the mating market at the moment with this sort of ever increasing group of educated and employed women and it is is pretty fascinating um mm-hmm. and also terrifying at the same time 
One other thing that I had in my mind with regards to cuckolding generally and a practice of non-monogamy more broadly, and I've got a ton of friends. I'm here in Austin, which is like the non-monogamy capital of America. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, but, but here is San Francisco. Uh, there is an element of, of fear that I have around a kind of Cheston's fence analogy going on here, that there are things which can be enjoyable, pleasurable, and even good for the individual, but which can be damaging uh, when you smear that across an entire society. You know, for instance, monogamy is pretty good for societal stability. You know, if you have it's a sexual redistribution strategy, if you do have that polygynous mm -hmm. society, you are looking at young male syndrome, you are looking at higher rates of loneliness, of reduced health span, of reduced birth rate, of re da, 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 all the way down. Um, I'm not saying that we need to start enforcing, like you can't do cuckolding in the comfort of your own home. Like you can do whatever you want. Right. Um, but I do think that it's an interesting, whatever, ethical or philosophical question to ask. You know, we put warnings on uh, cigarettes. We put warnings on foods that aren't particularly healthy for us. I don't know. I wonder if there is a, an equivalent uh, type of relationship set up that could be enjoyable to an individual, but could be uh, corrosive to them perhaps in the longer term. It could be corrosive to them. But we don't allow young people, we shouldn't allow young people to watch porn. Like for a similar sort of reason, that exposing people to uh, sexualized content at a young age isn't necessarily good for them. It's just a, a thought that I had in my mind. Mm -hmm. I, I think the, the issue is that one relationship type doesn't work for everybody. And um, a lot of the problem here has come from a, a historical approach that monogamy is the only right way to do it. And the more taboo you put around, you know, uh, uh, violating monogamy, the more exciting it's going to be for some people. Um, also, the more social structures require that, or at least the the appearance of it. I mean, I, you know, uh, as, as Dan Savage, you know, calls it monogamish, turns out to be much, much more common than we've ever taught than we've ever recognized. And I, again, I think the Part of the issue is that when we when we use the term monogamy, we're we're meaning sexual fidelity, but that's not actually what monogamy means. Monogamy means life partner. Means What's sexual fidelity? So uh, not being not having sex with other with other partners, um, but you can be monogamous to the definition of monogamy and still have sex with other partners. A lot of the birds, for instance, swans and geese that people have said, oh, they're so romantic, they, they mate for life. Well, yeah, they partner for life, but they still have sex with other, with other animals in the species. So, And 95% of birds don't have penises either, <laughs> I think, so... I'm not sure how much we can draw across. across That's fair. Them. Now, uh, you know, I, a comment that you made though just a moment ago is, and I think it relates. You know, should should kids, you know, be allowed to watch porn or have access to porn? I think it's a very complicated and, and, and challenging question. What what some research has found though is that the more parents try to prevent kids from seeing porn the more the kids want to see it, the more the kids work to seek it out. Um, what we find is that the, the kids that are younger and seeing porn or report seeing porn at younger ages tend to be higher sensation seeking kids already. They are kids that were already interested in sex. And the reason they saw porn was typically because they were seeking it out at younger ages. So the, you know, the whole social dialogue right now about you know, um, uh, the whether pornography is damaging for kids or not, not all kids are the same. And the other thing that we find is that the kids who are harmed by seeing porn, who learn unhealthy lessons, right? They learn that to have anal sex, you don't need lube or prep. They, they learn that, you know, to, to give a girl an orgasm, you just jump on and pump away. These are unhealthy lessons. Kids that learn those unhealthy lessons tend to be kids who think pornography is realistic sex. So kids that think pornography is realistic sex tend to be kids that have poor levels of sex education or have grown up in societies or cultures or communities where you don't talk about sex. The way we can protect kids from any harms from pornography 
is through giving them good sex education. Emily Rothman is in Boston. She's a psychologist and colleague, brilliant. And she's got really remarkable research on an evidence-based strategy called porn literacy, teaching young people, adolescents, what porn is and isn't, what they should or shouldn't learn from it. And that um, remarkably has very, very strong success for preventing kids from learning unhealthy lessons from, from pornography. I think definitely given the increased prevalence and ease of access that anybody that's got a smartphone and, you know, mm -hmm. nine-year-olds, 10-year-olds now are getting iPhones for Christmas. So I don't know, you put the parental block on and you've got some smart kid at 12 years mm -hmm. old that knows their phone better than their parents. Like, that's what are you right. going to do? Um, so in that regards, I, I, I suppose it's a, an, in, uh, an unwinnable war. Uh, I do think that porn literacy would make a lot of sense. I do, th there is something really brutal, unfortunate about the way that the human mind works, which has been, so you brought up a bunch of times today. As you try to wall off mm -hmm. a taboo, the typical response from at least a non-insignificant cohort of people is to try and seek that out more, right? I, I remember I used this story a few years ago where um, if you've ever been stood with somebody next to the edge of a cliff or whatever, mm -hmm. and you just think in your mind, like, I wonder what would happen if I push them over. And then you can't stop thinking about that thought because you think, oh my God, that's so terrible. I mustn't think about it. I mustn't think about it. Well, I'm thinking about how I mustn't think about it. So I'm thinking about mm -hmm. it. And you continue to refer yourself from the thought you mustn't have. Uh, that being said, as far as I'm concerned, exposing anybody that legally can't have sex to videos of people having sex seems to cross a line as far as I can see, unless it is like very structured, therapeutically done in a, an evidence-based way with the blah, blah, blah. I, I don't, I, I struggle to see how we would be able to justify exposing kids to videos and images of stuff that they, that would be illegal for them to enact. Yeah. Like, yeah. This famous sex educator years ago though, he said, what if we taught kids how to swim the same way we teach them about sex? We tell them, well, you can't do it until you're a certain age. Um, we can't expose you to information about it. Um, and you can hear us in the room having a lot of fun, but you don't get to know what's actually going on until you're 18. And then we throw open the doors and you can jump in the pool. How many kids would drown? I think that, and, and I'm not advocating that kids see porn by no means. It's for adults. But I think that there's a very significant kind of moral panic around this that is significantly exaggerated. Um, Alexander Stuhlhofer is a, a Croatian researcher who's looked at, for instance, you know, the relationship between, uh, you know, consuming violent pornography and uh, sexual engaging in sexual violence, specifically in adolescent males. And what he found was really interesting. He found that young men who watched less pornography were at greater risk of engaging in sexual violence and that me, the, the young men who were interested in watching sexually violent pornography actually stopped watching sexually violent pornography as time went on in this longitudinal study that, you know, the, uh, Access to pornography correlates with a very significant decrease in sexual violence in our society and in every society where this has been studied. There's a lot of fear about pornography that is uh, just like me when I was when I was reacting to those early couples that I saw that is based on morality and these intrinsic kind of intuitive fears but the data typically doesn't hold up. What are some of the other biggest myths that people hold around porn? 
Well, one of the ones that, that is, you know, all over the internet right now is, you know, porn induced erectile dysfunction, that watching too much porn causes erectile dysfunction. And so you've got these guys saying, well, porn broke my dick and, and I can get hard when I'm watching porn, but I can't get hard when I'm having sex with my trying to have sex with my female partner. It must be because of pornography. And there's absolutely no scientific evidence to support this. And there's lots and lots of evidence showing that, you know, watching porn is always going along with a certain behavior, right? Jerking off. And we, we talk about porn, but we don't talk about masturbation. So whenever we talk about porn, we have to talk about masturbation. Now, masturbation and sex are two different things. What we know is that, uh, Roughly half of men under age 45, around 40% of men, um, will report at least one episode of erectile dysfunction. And the number one predictor of that is anxiety, anxiety, obesity, drugs and alcohol, and limited sexual experience. Um, now, watching porn and masturbating is different from having sex. When I watch porn and masturbate, I don't have to buy the internet dinner. I don't have to worry about finding its clitoris. To turn it on, I just have to push the button. Um, but when I'm with a partner, I need to be mindful. I need to restrain my own sexual desires or behaviors and be sensitive to theirs. And if you are an anxious person with limited sexual experience, that can be challenging. Research uh, just last year uh, showed that in men that have any sexual dysfunction, delayed ejaculation, premature ejaculation, erectile dysfunction, the men are about 50% more likely to experience symptoms of that dysfunction during partnered sex and not during masturbation. Because again, during masturbation, you can sit back and relax. <sighs> So how do we how do we address that by trying to reduce the anxiety by trying to help guys learn to not be so penis focused in their sex to learn and um, other behaviors expand the definition of sex, but for these insecure guys who are on these chat rooms and no fap rooms and every other darn thing where they're being told. If your penis doesn't work every time, then it's broken and you're less of a man. It creates this anxiety shame spiral that increases iatrogenically the occurrence of that What's anxiety. What's iatrogenically? Iatrogenic is when a intervention that is supposed to help something actually um, uh, creates more harm. So if you go in the hospital for uh, appendicitis and you get your appendix taken out, but then you get a staph infection, that's iatrogenic, where the healing actually caused another problem. So the intervention of trying to prevent erectile dysfunction appears to actually be increasing it. And now there's one group that we do, one group of men that we do see struggle with erectile function when they are um, with a partner, uh, but not when they're watching porn, but it's driven by shame. Guys who are ashamed of watching pornography are more likely to have difficulties performing um, or getting erect when they're with their partner because they're ashamed of their private sexual behavior. A lot of this is, is the shame, not the porn. Typically watching porn, and again, accompanied by masturbation, is an indicator of libido. Guys who w watch more porn have more sex. This is data that comes up consistently because watching porn and masturbating to it is an indicator of your overall desire for sex. And those guys overall are more likely to pursue sex or value it um, and, and so enact it in their life. If shame causes erectile dysfunction, and stopping porn stops the shame, then surely proximally stopping porn stops erectile dysfunction. Not so much because um, the there's this interesting phenomenon of uh, it, it's called a flattening, where um, the more conservative your attitudes are about about sex and porn, the more you start to view any kind of uh, sexual stimuli, whether it's Frederick's or Hollywood catalog, I don't know if they make that anymore, um, uh, as, as porn. And we see this huge number of religious men who identify as addicted to porn, but report that they haven't watched porn in the past month. In fact, there's a significant number of religious men who identify as addicted to pornography, but have never watched porn. 
So it's the porn starts to become this stand in for sexual desires or thoughts that they feel like they're not supposed to have. The number one predictor of identifying as a porn addict is not how much porn you watch, but whether you were raised religious. Um, so when, when somebody comes to me and says they, they're addicted to pornography or they're addicted to sex, what that tells me as a therapist is that they have thoughts and feelings and desires about sex that they wish they didn't have. As a therapist, I now want to try and understand why do you think you shouldn't have those thoughts? And what, what do you think those thoughts mean about you as a person? Can we explore that? The, 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 the research on effective treatments for people that struggle with these sexual behaviors or desires is not actually getting them to stop the sexual behavior, but instead engaging in cognitive behavioral therapy or acceptance and commitment therapy, which are strategies that try to change the function of the behavior and try to address the meaning and the cognitions that we put to the behavior. You could imagine for a, a large group of probably secular, probably mostly non-religious guys who are in NoFap subreddits and whatnot that the choice between i have shame around porn use and masturbation that makes me feel like i shouldn't do it and it has potentially caused me to perform more poorly with a partner or make me feel like less of a man i can go through act or cbt or i can stop watching porn and stop masturbating for many of them that is a much simpler easier to control more immediate return. So I can see, I mean, I, the, the evidence with regards to NoFap, I don't know. I mean, there's some of it that's a little bit overblown that you're going to levitate and that women can smell your pheromones <laughs> and stuff like that. That, does, that. that did always seem a little bit far out to me. But I can also see how the level of shame that you have or the level of self-judgment that you have around anything can manifest in as real of a way as you want due to an expectation effect, right? You know, the placebo effect, if we could bottle mm -hmm. it, would be the strongest effect in pharmacology. And there's an equivalent in psychology as well with the expectation effect. If you are expecting to feel bad because of doing a thing and you stop doing the thing, the alleviation of feeling bad by no longer doing it is going to not be insignificant. Yeah, again, though, um, what is the definition of the behavior? And so a lot of the, um, a lot of the, the, the folks, you know, online that, that want to stop masturbating, they unfortunately will now frame as a relapse, um, any sexual thoughts, any, any sexual fantasies, um, a wet dream that, that biologically is going to happen if you stop having, um, regular emissions. Uh, your body is going to get rid of old sperm by having a, by having a nocturnal emission in a wet dream. The 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 abstinence only goal increases distress, depression, and suicidality. Um, unfortunately, because it that shows up in the data. Yeah, yeah, in study after study, and people that participate more and more and more in these abstinence-only forums um, are sh are they're showing higher levels of anxiety, higher levels of depression, um, and and more and more thoughts of suicide. It's unfortunate because the goal, the abstinence goal, it's not necessarily a healthy one, right? Um, how many, how many, how many ejaculations or orgasms should a man have every month to have the most healthy prostate, right? 22. A man should have urologically recommended 22 orgasms a month for the, for the healthiest prostate. Now, my prostate effectively at this point is immortal. Um, when I die, my prostate will probably live on for another 100 or 200 years. There's no point at which sex stops being healthy. Um, uh, people who have more sex live longer. Now, we don't know if that's because healthier people have more sex or because having sex makes you healthier. It's probably both. But there's no point on that curve where it all of a sudden goes down where, okay, that's too much sex. Sex appears to be a very healthy human behavior and masturbating appears to increase 
sexual desire, increase testosterone levels, increase sexual performance. Pe men and women who masturbate more tend to have more sex and tend to enjoy sex more. Again, there's a chicken and egg kind of phenomenon. They're, ha they're masturbating more because they like sex, because it's, it, it's a valuable experience to them. They're more motivated toward, towards it. But sex is also a muscle. The more sex you have, the more you want to have sex. The less sex you have, the less sex you want to have. And so there, um, uh, the idea that, you know, if I, if I stop masturbating, that then I'll be a better lover in, in, in sexual medicine is simply not true. Have you looked at how porn use affects single people's drive to find a mate? Um, yeah, actually, um, I'm, well, I mean, I have not, um, uh, but a guy named uh, Sam Perry, as a researcher in Oklahoma, and he's looked at this, and um, a really interesting paper dropped, I think, just last year, um, where uh, basically, you know, looked at the question of um, because porn is a cheap and easy sexual outlet, um, uh, does it, uh, you know, is, is it like fast food? So the guys um, will stop wanting the steak dinner. They'll stop pursuing marriage and found no evidence to support it. That um, again, watching porn is an expression of lib of libido and desire for sex. And uh, people who watch porn and masturbate want more sex. And sex is different than masturbation because in sex with a partner, we have touch and we have another person there and we can smell them and um, all of these things that all of these stimuli that are not present in masturbating to pornography. So masturbating to pornography is not something that blocks interest or takes the place of uh, sex. Now, I will give a caveat in that I do see people um, oftentimes where a man, for instance, is choosing to watch pornography and masturbate rather than having sex with his wife. And there's this kind of idea then that, you know, the porn and masturbation has become, has taken the place of sex with his wife. But what I consistently find in those cases is a couple of things. One is that the couple stopped having sex as frequently. And so the guy is watching porn and masturbating to compensate um, for the decrease sex frequency. But two, the wife is um, not interested in the same kind of sex that the husband is interested in. Oftentimes, the wife is more shaming of sex um, and views masturbation as uh, shameful or, or immoral. And so more and more and more, the guy is now faced with, well, it, it's not that I don't want to have sex, but I'm not sure I want to have sex with you because of conflict in the relationship or because of sexual mismatch. Um, again, Sam Perry found that um, early, he is his early research in 17, he found that watching porn predicted later divorce. He went, now he's a great researcher and he went back to that research later on um, at suggestions of folks like me who were saying, you know, there's, there's more to this story. And, found that if you separate out the the variants of masturbation in those couples, that actually porn watching had a neutral to slightly positive uh, predictive uh, relationship with the marriage. But masturbation frequency predicted later divorce. Now, it's not that masturbation um, is causing divorce, but masturbation and increases in masturbation frequency reflect a mismatch of sexual desire within the relationship. And it's that mismatch that is causing the later divorce and relationship problems. Typically, you know, and, and this is this is my mantra is that, you know, Porn related problems, sex related problems overwhelmingly are symptomatic of other issues. And unfortunately, when we focus on the porn or the sex, I call it the sexy, shiny object syndrome. We get distracted by the sex. We blame the sex or the porn for everything. Yeah. I, I see, I see many men who come in there and they're struggling with porn and they're watching porn too much and they identify as porn addicts. Well, these are guys with OCD or really significant anxiety problems that they're not treating. Uh, 
Watching porn and masturbating is a great way to turn off your anxiety for a little while, but they need other ways to turn off that anxiety. Um, and they need help dealing with the anxiety, but they get distracted and people around them get distracted by blaming the porn. Mm. What, what, what would you say to somebody that's listening to this and says, I don't like my relationship with porn. I don't like my relationship with masturbation. Um, what would you tell them? Um, so I see a lot of those guys and I, and I, and I talk about this a lot in my, in my third book, it's called ethical porn for dicks, a man's guide to responsible viewing pleasure. And, um, first, I think that's actually a really good question to ask yourself. Unfortunately, many people don't think about their sexuality when they're not turned on. They don't think about how they think feel about their sexual desires, behaviors, or interests when they're not turned on. Now, when we are turned on, um, our uh, sexual disgust and our disgust reactions go down. Um, our, our friend and colleague, uh, Diana Fleischman, has remarkable research on this, showing the relationship between disgust and sexual arousal. When we are turned on, we are less disgusted by things that we find disgusting when we are not turned on. So being turned on changes the way we think. I want people to think about their sexuality when they're not turned on. And I want them to think about how it makes them feel about themselves. But then I also want them to ask the question, where did I get that? Is that right? Do I believe that? Many of us were raised with racist and sexist values, homophobic values as children. But many of us now reject those values. We, we, we don't believe in racism or homophobia or sexism. So, so our values and our attitudes can and do change. If you were taught that, you know, masturbating made you less of a man, I want you to ask where you got that idea. And I want you to also think about why did the people who told you that think that? What were they wanting? Now, we <laughs> I, I hate to say this because it sounds ridiculous, but in fact, the Nazis in, uh, told Hitler youth that they shouldn't masturbate and that wanting to masturbate made them less of a man man because it was a way to create insecurity that they could then capitalize on and use to manipulate the young men churches i mean the christian church has has gotten thousands of years of control over people by creating sexual insecurity and by framing masturbation um, as as unhealthy. There's a remarkable researcher in, in Israel named Yane Vifradi, and he's he's got this incredible paper um, called Oh God, I Can't Stop Thinking About It. And he actually showed that the more religious a person was, the more they tried not to think about masturbation. And of course, as you and I have said multiple times today, the more you try not to think about something, the more you think about it. And the more distressed and anxious and ashamed they became about it. So if somebody's telling you these things, why? Um, you know, Kellogg's Corn Flakes was invented as a food, to, as a bland food that wouldn't trigger physical hedonic pleasure and lead to people wanting to masturbate and have more sex. Because again, there's this, there's this idea that masturbation somehow depletes you. Um, Samuel Tissot was a Swiss physician in the 1600s who first argued in European literature that um, masturbation depletes men of some uh, essential kind of element. Turns out not to be true. Um, turns out, you know, the, 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 the stuff that comes out of your penis when you have an orgasm, it's not your brains. It's not, um, it's not energy. Um, and masturbation appears to be a very, very healthy behavior that has been socially stigmatized. David Lay, ladies and gentlemen, if people want to keep up to date with the stuff that you do, where should they go? 
Uh, you know, you can find me on Twitter um, at Dr. David Lay on Instagram, David Lay PhD, and I've got a website, davidlayphd.com. Uh, it is important to know, though, that Lay is spelled L E Y, not L A Y. Sounds like getting laid. David, I appreciate you. Thank you. What's happening, people? Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that episode, then press here for a selection of the best clips from the podcast over the last few weeks. And don't forget to subscribe. Peace.